This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Leather Armor Fantasy is tricky sometimes, especially when it comes to role-playing games. On the one hand, players accept that the world is fantastic and full of magic and dragons and other things that technically do not actually exist. On the other hand, in order for the game to make sense, players expect that the world works pretty much the way you would expect the world to work. Players expect things like gravity and weather and natural forces. And, as the players of role-playing games are generally a pretty savvy and well-educated lot, their expectations about the nature of the world can be pretty sophisticated. So, for example, when the fourth edition of Dungeons & Dragons introduced a new race of dragon people, the Dragonborn, and concept art depicted female dragonborn with breasts, there was a problem. Do we even have to reassure you at this point that this will come back around to leather armor? Haven't we earned your trust yet? The issue with female dragonborn with breasts stems from the fact that, based on our real-world understanding, dragons are reptilian. They are scaly, cold-blooded, egg-laying monstrosities. But breasts, aka mammaries, are the purview of mammals. Hence the name, breasts, nipples, and mammary glands belong to warm-blooded creatures that birth live young and nurse their young on milk. Now, you might argue that the game is just fantasy and it shouldn't matter. And a lot of people did. But others argued that the game is grounded in the real world, and whenever the game departs from reality, it should do so with good reason. And there didn't seem to be any good reason. Except, of course, that most artists and art directors, when depicting fantasy creatures, search for ways to show gender dimorphism. Gender dimorphism is, of course, the biological trait wherein the male and female members of a species have distinct differences in their body shapes. Reptiles don't show a lot of gender dimorphism. And the lack of dimorphism can lead to the illusion, for example, that all dragonborn in D&D are male which is something they wanted to avoid. Why are we talking about this? Because it comes down to something that poet and philosopher Samuel Taylor Coleridge called the willing suspension of disbelief. In his 1817 autobiography, Biographical Literaria, Coleridge observed that if a writer added enough human interest and semblance of truth to an otherwise fantastical tale, the reader would ignore the implausibility of the tale and simply enjoy it. He viewed the suspension of disbelief as a contract between writer and reader. The writer had to earn the reader's willingness to ignore crazy, implausible, illogical, or unrealistic things. But nowadays, we tend to view suspension of disbelief solely as the reader's burden. If the reader wants to enjoy a piece of fiction, they sure as hell had better be ready to accept it as fiction. And so, the great dragon boob debate really came down to a two-century-old argument about who really took responsibility for suspension of disbelief, the reader or the author. But there's another side to this whole thing. There's another term. And that's the one that connects us to the weird world of non-existent armor. Yes, that's right. Non-existent armor. And we're going to prematurely apologize to all of the rogues and rangers out there for taking away your armor. In the 1970s, a theory emerged among sci-fi authors called the theory of cognitive estrangement. It was related to the willing suspension of disbelief, but it was a little different. Initially, the term referred to the idea that if you introduced a plot device that explained a difference between your fantastical world and the real world, and if your fantastical world and the real world were close enough to each other, suspension of disbelief became easier. For example, in the real world, nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. In the Star Trek world, spaceships have to travel faster than the speed of light, or else the episodes get very long and boring and each season would involve an entire new generation of crew members. And so, the creators invented the warp drive. Powered by science, the warp drive generates a field of twisted and bent space-time which alters the local laws of physics. 
a starship can exploit these alterations and basically ride a wave of bent space-time to its destination at any speed it wants. Over time, though, the term cognitive estrangement subtly twisted in its meaning. See, that whole warp field theory sounds good, doesn't it? It sounds plausible. But it only sounds plausible because you're not an astrophysicist and you aren't intimately familiar with the full body of the works of Albert Einstein. Cognitive estrangement actually takes advantage of a reader's ignorance to spackle over fantastical elements. Instead of earning suspension of disbelief with a good story the way Coleridge intended, it covers up the fantastical elements with confusion. Another example of cognitive estrangement is the utterly ridiculous list of armor that exists in the D&D universe. You might argue about whether Dragonborn have boobs or whether a fireball spell can work underwater, but no one is going to argue the reality of, say, leather armor or whatever the hell scale mail is. Because those are real, right? I mean, that's just historical armor. Sorry. First of all, Let's address the mail thing. In the 5th edition of D&D, you have chain shirts, chain mail, ring mail, and scale mail. And you can probably picture all of those things in your head. But the reason you can picture all of those things in your head is because you've watched a lot of movies and played a lot of video games. First off, the word mail specifically refers to a mesh of interlocked metal rings or chain links. All mail is chain mail. And if it isn't chain mail, it isn't mail. And chain mail is technically redundant. The invention of mail armor is credited to both the Celts and the Etruscans, but it quickly spread. The Romans adopted it from the Celts and it spread across North Africa, the Middle East, and into the East. The thing you think of as a chain shirt is actually one component of mail armor. It's the hauberk, the coat, a sleeved long tunic. But full mail armor also included leggings and a coif or headpiece. Now, scale mail did exist, but it wasn't called scale mail. It was actually a much older type of armor, one of three ancient types of armor, actually. Scale, laminar, and lamellar armor are the three major types of pre medieval armor. Scale armor consisted of small plates or scales, like a dragon's or a fish's, sewn to a backing of cloth or leather in overlapping rows. Remember that, we're coming back to it. As for ring mail, no one is quite sure if that existed. Traditionally, it is seen as a version of scale armor, except instead of scales, metal rings are sewn into the backing. It seems to have become popular in Victorian depictions of medieval armor, but no archaeological records of it exist, and the few historical depictions that suggest it might have existed have probably been misinterpreted. However, ring mail did gain some popularity in film because mail armor doesn't look good on screen. The archers in Ridley Scott's epic 2000 summer blockbuster Gladiator, for example, are seen wearing mail consisting of huge rings or links that an arrow could easily penetrate, because mail armor just doesn't photograph well. Another thing that Gladiator depicted is a hell of a lot of leather armor. And now we come down to it. Because leather armor probably didn't exist, especially not in the ways we think it did. At least, not in most of the Western world. When you picture fantasy leather armor, you probably have a few different pictures in your head. First of all, you have the leather jerkins or doublets or vests that Robin Hood types wore. Second, you've got that cured, stiffened leather breastplate and bracers and greaves that basically look like Roman armor, only leather. Third, you've got the form-fitting, tight suits of leather armor that acrobatic rogues and elves favor in D&D. And finally, you've got the suit of dark leather covered in metal rivets or studs. Studded leather. And truth is, none of them probably existed. Now we should begin by noting that the existence of leather armor is a controversial topic. It's complicated by the fact that leather just doesn't last like iron does. The fact that we haven't found good archaeological evidence of leather armor isn't surprising, even if it was in common use. And statues, tapestries, and depictions from history don't give us any clues as to materials. 
For example, the ringmail armor that we think might have been a thing can be seen in the famous Bayeux Tapestry, depicting the Norman conquest of England. It sure looks like ringmail was a thing, but that might just be because the stitching just wasn't fine enough to depict mail accurately. Basically, it's a resolution problem. That said, there's some good reasons to believe that leather armor just wasn't in very common usage. For example, that nice form-fitting leather armor? Unless you're making that from the hide of something pretty massive and powerful, like a crocodile or an elephant, it just wouldn't provide much resistance. It wouldn't be much better than cloth. But it would be much more expensive. Honestly, most leather armors depicted in fantasy should basically be called leather clothing. They just don't do much good on the battlefield. Does that mean that no one ever made armor out of leather? No. In point of fact, there were a couple of ancient armors that were probably made out of leather. They just aren't as fancy as the armors we think of as leather armor. For example, remember the scale armor we discussed? Scale armor could be made out of just about any layered scale-shaped thing. Scale armors were made out of bronze, iron, horn, even the scales of the pangolin or spiny anteater, and even rawhide, leather, and cure boli. Yeah, in pre-medieval times, you had leather scale armor. Another ancient type of armor, lamellar armor, was also occasionally made with leather. Lamellar armor consists of small rectangular panels called lamellae sewn together. Imagine sewing a vest out of little rectangular tiles. That's lamellar armor. And again, lamellar armors could be made of any of a variety of materials. Lamellar armor was particularly popular in the East, and it gradually overtook scale armor as THE armor to wear. Samurai armor was traditionally a combination of what we would call lamellar and scale armors. In fact, leather armors were more popular in the Eastern world because of the presence of large and powerful beasts to make good armor from. They had elephants and crocodiles and oxen. But what about those boiled leather breastplates like they had in Gladiator? Surely a leather breastplate or quoros is possible, right? The answer is yes and no. There are three basic types of leather, rawhide, leather, and courbouli. Rawhide is just what it sounds like. It is untreated, untanned animal skin, and it could be used for making scale armors. Leather is tanned animal hide. Tanned leather is durable, but remains flexible. Most importantly, though, it halts decomposition. First, the hide is cleaned of grease, gore, and hair. Then it is soaked in a mixture of water and a preservative like urine or lime. Then the hide would be pounded with dung or animal brains, usually with the bare hands or feet. And then they would be treated with salt to complete the tanning process. Because of the combination of rotting flesh, dung, fat, grease, and urine, tanning was the most foul-smelling of all medieval industries. It was usually banned from cities or limited to the very edges of settlements. It also employed a lot of child labor. Children would be paid to gather dung and also to collect urine from public piss pots, that's their word for it, not ours, for use in the tanning process. As for cure bully, well, if you wanted to make the leather stiffer and more durable, you could take it and boil it. Often wax or oil were added to further harden the leather. After being removed from the solution, the leather remained flexible briefly and could be molded into a shape. And then it would stiffen and retain that shape. Boiled leather, cure bully, was occasionally used to make small armor segments like arm and leg protection. And plates of it were used to make lamellar or scale armor. But the idea of a breastplate or larger armor piece made of boiled leather probably wouldn't work because of the size of the leather pieces needed for the construction. Now, what about studded leather armor? It's easy enough to assume that poor depictions and poor archaeological records have led us to misunderstand how leather armors might be made. But studded leather armor seems to be a complete fabrication. Even if you could make an awesome suit of supremely protective, form-fitting leather armor, why would you put rivets through it at all? Well, our best guess is that studded leather armor came about because of depictions of brigandine armor. Brigandine armor 
was a transitional armor. It existed between the eras of scale, laminar, and lamellar armor, and the mail and plate armor era. Essentially, it consisted of a sleeveless doublet or vest with armor plates riveted to it. Often, the plates would be riveted between two layers of stout cloth or leather. So, from the outside, it might look like a riveted coat of cloth or leather, but inside were plates of leather or thin metal. But why didn't lamellar or scale leather armor survive into the medieval period? After all, mail and plate armors were expensive. Well, there was another option. D&D calls it padded armor. In reality, it was the gambeson, the padded jack, or the arming doublet. It was essentially a quilted jacket made of stiff cloth or canvas and stuffed with scrap cloth or horsehair. It was surprisingly resistant. It could be worn on its own as a poor man's hauberk, or it could be worn underneath mail or plate armor. And it was cheaper and easier to make than lamellar or scale armors made of leather and offered similar protection. In short, no one was going to wear leather armor when a gambeson was just as good but cheaper and easier. In point of fact, the tradition of sewing large buttons or metal discs onto a gambeson as decoration may also have led to the misunderstanding of studded leather armor. So how can you use this in your game? Well, you could take out all the leather armor and the ring mail and whatever the hell splint is supposed to be, but that's hardly useful. This stuff is just fun to know, and there's no good reason to tell rogues they can't look cool. The more useful lesson is the lesson about cognitive estrangement and suspension of disbelief. The fact is that no creator or game master can take suspension of disbelief for granted. Every player or reader is different. Some will happily accept non-existent armor and dragon boobs, and others will balk. Some will accept fireball spells, but scoff the moment they work underwater. And the players aren't wrong. The readers aren't wrong. The burden is, as Samuel Taylor Coleridge observed, on the creator to make the story so engaging that the audience won't notice or care about the inconsistencies. This has been the GM Word of the Week. It was written by the Angry GM and recorded and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can find more at theangrygm.com and madadventurers.com.